Today I'm coming to you from Gross Family Farm where pigs are being raised in the woods. There's a persimmon tree right behind me. They can drop for the pigs, but the pigs aren't just raised in the woods. They're also raised out on pasture, which is right down that way. We're gonna find out how Luke farmer Luke Gross is doing it in this video. Stay tuned for that coming up. While Luke raises his pigs in the woods, he also raises them here on pasture, at least this section of the pasture. And part of where I'm standing used to be a, a winter squash patch, which is actually where they're grazing right now, cleaning that up. If we turn the camera right here, in the background you'll see the winter squash patch that they're now grazing on, cleaning that all up. It's this mix of woods and pasture that really works in Luke's context for his land. He doesn't have enough woods just to do them in the woods, and he doesn't want to do them all on pasture because he does want to keep some of this pasture smooth for cutting hay and running uh, animals like sheep across, so he doesn't want too much rooting on it. But this section is all fair game for the pigs and part of the goal here is the squash grew now it's time for the pigs to clean it up we're gonna find out how Luke's doing it all what he's doing his philosophy on it and learn some interesting things in this one so stay tuned for that it's Luke Gross Gross Family Farms on pigs coming up Luke we're standing in front of your pigs here can you talk about why pigs for you to start why did you want this as part of your farm operation sure um, we, uh, we started with pigs partially because we, we thought that they could be profitable. Um, it's a big part of it. And we, we, uh, we, liked, um, we liked eating pork and we just wanted to dip our toe into, into meat production. It seemed like a good first step. Um, but when it comes to why we still do pigs, um, we do them because, because of the profitability and the ability to utilize um, sort of land around the edges of our farm in a way that um, really makes some of what would be the most marginal land the most profitable land on our farm. Right, because you have an interesting setup here. They're currently rooting around in what was a former squash patch, mm -hmm. but then you also have this patch, which we'll show in a minute, connected to the wood. So you give them access to both. It's essentially free choice right. uh, foraging for them. Yeah. And so they're performing a couple functions in here for you you know they're cleaning up this patch right and then they're also you know putting on weight which is part of the what you need them yeah. to do and uh, our plan is to bring a cover crop in here and as you can see behind me there was a was a bunch of weeds that came up at the end of the time in the patch and we'll be coming in here with some rye and some um, Austrian pea and they'll be stomping in that cover crop and and kind of creating some soil contact for that to, to come in here and we can we can get the ground covered with something a little less weedy. So, so just broadcast it out and let them trample mm -hmm. it in. Yeah, on their last day we usually like to do that and let them kind of stomp it in for us. Or how have you dealt with pigs in pasture? You know, there's obviously a lot of rooting here. Sure. For you, how does that work in terms of unsmoothing out the pasture, you know, roughing it up. Yeah. Is that a big deal? Does it just, you make it work? How do you make it work? It definitely is a big deal. And we, we don't let our pigs, I mean, where we're standing right here, two feet outside of the pig's paddock, it's our, it's our hay field and, and they don't get out here unless um, something's gone wrong. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we try to keep them off of our, our three quarters of our farm that is, is uh, intended to be just for grazing. Um, that's just for the chickens and sheep. The the pigs, they stay on the on the forest here along this eastern border. There's another patch of woods over there and over there, and that's kind of where we have them, either in the forest or just at the edge. Well, for people who graze cattle, they'll see the effect of having cattle on pasture. They'll see poultry right. have the effect on pasture. For all the years that you've done this with pigs, have you seen any sort of direct correlation, you think, between where the pigs have rooted up the pasture and what that pasture's turned into or how it's evolved? Um, I've, I've started to see some changes, um, particularly in this area, even just behind me. Um, this is our second year with pigs in there. It's kind of a more scrubby, early succession um, part, like part of woods where you've got a mixture of things like blackberry and honeysuckle um, on the understory, but then also some sort of what would be considered low quality trees. Um, and we've seen the, them kind of open up that floor where there's more, um, I guess, useful forages growing on the floor um, in behind them um, when they do knock back some of those um, brambly thicket kind of, kind of things. And so it becomes a little bit more of what I would kind of call useful silvopasture type of environment as opposed to sort of a, a thick brambly mess. Um, you can actually walk around in there, which is a pretty big benefit if you want to be able to do anything in there. Um, but 
Um, in other contexts, I think, that, that are not quite like what I described there, you have to be a lot more careful because they can put a lot more pressure than you want a lot, very quickly. Um, so that's where we've, we've sort of decided we want to tread lightly and give them a little bit um, longer breaks between their times in some of the more mature woods or um, even some of the open areas that we, we don't want um, too much pressure. It's little to none time out there is what we allow. In some of these scrubby areas, you've purposely used them as a tool yeah. to help speed up the succession or mm -hmm. really force the succession. Right, yeah. And even sort of, uh, you know, there's, you could say that that scrubby type of um, mid-succession is sort of like this really productive place between um, between pasture and forest along the succession and we're sort of um, bumping it back um, into something that grows grass and but it's gonna start growing the the brambly stuff again and but and that's but there's a there's a lot of a uh, lot of carbon being um, brought into the system by that wide diversity of things that are that are in that kind of growth phase so we're we're sort of knocking it back intentionally at a place that's like I think a really productive um, point in the forest succession stage. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, it yeah. does. You know, when you set up these paddocks like this, given that this one is partially pasture, partially woods, are you always trying to have that blend of pasture woods or do you ever go just all pasture, all woods? Um, we we do all of the above, I would say. Um, there's a section over here where it's more mature woods right with right on the edge of our pasture. Um, we, just, we just give them woods there and try to move them fast enough that they're not going to be um, messing with the, the root structure of the, the mature trees. Um, as you come further down, this just happens to be where we, it doesn't happen to be, we designed it to where we would have this um, half acre garden area at the edge of the woods. So this strip of woods, um, it, it is directly adjacent to this half acre plot intentionally so that we can sort of just bring our pigs out from their sort of pork assembly line of, of a strip of woods and then we've got this little extra section that we we give them access to. And then the other area we put them in is spring and fall. Sometimes we've got this really low sort of uh, a low pasture area that gets inundated with water sometimes and because because it doesn't drain very well it has really poor quality forages and so I'll use the pigs down there sort of um, let them open up the soil and root it up and then I'll come in and try to I'll, I'll try to get anything established I can kind of behind them but the last couple of years I've had the pigs down there two or three times it's about three quarters of an acre of ground that um, yeah it doesn't grow much good quality forage but we've come in there with sorghum sudan and pearl millet and a bunch of other things that we can at least get annuals to grow in there for a time um, and we're, we're thinking about establishing some perennials but for right now it's sort of we're, we're sort of growing annual crops for our sheep with the pigs coming in and tilling it up for us. It's kind of the, the, the mantra we've had the last two seasons. You know, one of the things we started talking about here at the beginning is, you know, why pigs? They make sense economically for you. Can you talk about the profitability or, or how pigs, say, compare to chickens on sure. a business scale for people that want to get into this if they're yeah. just focusing on the number side of things? On the number side, I would say pigs, um, they're going to put more pressure on your land than chickens, um, and that, that's something you have to factor in, but, um, but they, uh, fewer people eat pork than chicken, so it's, it's a little bit tougher of a sell. If, if you're going to only have one, I think it's, it's a, it's a little bit easier to sell a bunch of chicken than a bunch of pork if it's like your only, only game. But aside from that, the chickens require more time, um, per, per dollar, per pound of meat. Um, but they're both somewhat similar. I think the pork you get a little bit more um, of a profit margin, um, and the, on the chickens you get a. I've, I've found it's a it's a lower profit margin at least for the way we do it, and it's more work. Um, but it's an easier it's an easier item to, to sell a whole whole lot of. Um, the pasture poultry is is a, is in a lot of people's budget and in a lot of people's minds is like a really great product. Um, from what I can tell. You know, in terms of workload here, you have to fill the bulk feeder, mm -hmm. you know, occasionally, probably sure. not every day. Yeah. And how often are you moving the fences? Um, about once a week, um, kind of depending on a few factors. I mean, if it's real rainy or something, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move it um, potentially a bit more often than that if we need to. 
Um, as you can see, they're putting a lot of pressure on this ground for less than one day right so now. So pretty minimal workload though, compared to the, like, you know, a daily move of pasture poultry, feeding yeah. the pasture poultry feeders every day, waterers oh, yeah. every day. This is a lot less intense. Oh yeah, yeah, way, way less work. Um, it's also nice that the pigs can be, the, the work can be spread out more over a whole year. Um, you can you can raise pigs any month of the year. There's months where it works better than others, but pasture poultry, you gotta you gotta grow it in like your tomato growing season is kind of your your peak, and then you gotta on the, on the edges you can extend that a little bit. But nobody in Indiana is doing pasture poultry in February. It's, sure. it's not really an option. In terms of breed, what have you found has worked well for you, and do you think it matters? Um, I think it matters some, but there's a whole lot that matters a whole lot more than. Um, there, there's, a, yeah, there's a whole lot of things that matter more than the breed. Um, here we've got two different breeders' pigs, and I like them both a lot. One of them is sort of a, um, a blue butt, um, which is a cross in and of itself, but it's a cross between a blue butt and a Berkshire. And the other ones are um, a Tamworth Red Wattle cross, I believe. And uh, I like them both. The, the, the Tamworth Red Wattle crosses are growing a lot slower but they're still putting on weight at a, at a you know, decent rate. Um, they all seem to forage great, and um, they all taste great, and they're not too lean, or there's, I, don't, I don't find I have any, any problems or any complaints about the meat. Um, there, there may be a little bit more marbling in, in some versus others, but we, we found that um, the, the biggest factor is finding healthy pigs. Um, when, we're, when we're shopping for pigs, um, nothing's as important as that. Um, it's, it's finding them from a healthy source and and then making sure like they their initial transition to the farm is one where we, we continue to maintain that health, um, generally by keeping them outdoors and not um, stuffed up in some building, learning to, to do electric wire there. Um, that's where we've had the best luck. Um, and, and if they get off to a running head start, then I feel like you know most any full-size pig could work in this system. When you think about farrowing on farm, what comes to mind? Um, sexually active boars being a, a a thing that I've dealt with before, and uh, and just we don't have um, really hardcore tight fencing, um, and and just just managing all that testosterone um, is something I've I've done once, and I I kind of for the price people will sell all really high quality feeder pigs for, and for the the headaches that you get trying to manage um, that it's uh, it's it's so cheap to buy those pigs compared with what you what you have to put up with or the kind of fencing you would need to do it right. I've heard that a few times on this trip. The economics, like it just yeah. doesn't make sense to do it on farm. Yeah. I don't know that most of the people who are fearing pigs know how to do math, uh, honestly, because <laughs> I, I look at like feeding the boar and feeding the sows. Um, a lot of these guys kind of just do it as a backdoor, like a like a backyard hobby kind of thing um, and it's great and I think they like when I when I come and um, you know load my truck up with every pig they've got um, it's great but uh, I don't know that their feed bill is, is uh, getting much more than paid for plus all the work and so yeah we, we like it a lot and it works great for us just to, to buy it from those folks um, and as long as they keep on doing it we and and we've got some really good relationships with four or five different breeders but as long as they keep on doing it um, we we don't feel um, like there's really any need to do farrowing, um, especially after trying it once. So Luke, now we're at the backside of your pig paddock here. You have them on pasture, which we saw previously. Mm -hmm. You also fence off a section of the woods. How do you find they spend their time? And is it mostly in the woods? Do they do it by the heat of the day? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot by the heat of the day. Um, pigs like to sleep in, um, they'll usually sleep no matter the weather, they like to sleep under um, some sort of bush or shrub if, you, if they've got access to it or in the woods. Um, but along the edge of the woods, there's this edge habitat situation. They love hanging out in it, and it's it's a you know scrubby, a lot of undergrowth kind of stuff. So they'll spend a lot of time in there if it's hot, um, if it's windy, if it's cold. Um, but whenever the temperatures are pleasant to a pig, which would be um, you know 40 to 80, um, they're gonna they're gonna spend a lot of their time out foraging, rooting around. Um, if there's anything to be done in the soil, they'll mm. they'll they'll fluff it up and and knock it over and and try to look for grubs, um, you know, roots, any anything they can find that might be a treat. For fencing them in in the woods, what's been your general strategy for doing that? It looks like you've 
you know, carved out a path here to go around. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people when they think about moving temporary fence in the woods, yeah. it could be a hassle, could be tough. How's it been for you? Uh, it works fine for us. Um, this, uh, this kind of uh, rapid regrowth sort of underbrush situation does require a little bit of maintenance to cut the lines in there, but we'll come in with a, I think you call it a bill hook. It looks sort of like this, like, Mongolian death weapon or something like that. It's <laughs> it's a it's like a long axe handle with a like a sling blade a sword at the end. Something like a sling blade yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. We'll come in here with uh with that and I'll just hack down, you know, 2 inch thick ash trees or anything down to um, you know, grass that's grown up real tall, but I'll come in and just hack down a a place where I can get two wires in there. It doesn't have to be very wide. Um, as you can probably see um, but just enough to get two wires, one at about nine, one at about 18 inches in there. And then um, we'll, we'll cut that in and then, you know, bringing in these little stepping posts. It's, it's a pretty simple process. I'm doing two wires. Sometimes I will do one. Um, if Good I'm luck with that. Rush. Two or one? Um, two or one has worked. Bigger pigs is the only thing I'd do one on, kind of sort of in that finishing size. Up, upwards of 180, 200 pound pigs. We can make one wire work. If you're doing one, what height do you tend to have that at? One, one 200 pound pig, I would put it just below knee height, something like that. Okay. Yeah, let's say 16 inches. And then two, you know, I know some people stress on two, but you don't have any problems with pigs getting out with the system. Um, not, not if it's hot enough and um, especially hot enough at certain ages. If we, we have problems with pigs getting out, but it's usually if the pig fence wasn't hot enough and if it's right when the pigs are new on the farm or at this size range, I don't know if I'd call this teenage age, but when they're in that 150 pound range, I think they just get a little bit more interested in exploring, a little bit more interested in testing that wire. Mm -hmm. um, my experience is at those two ages, you want it to be real hot. Um, other times, you can even have it off for a few days. They might not even notice. You know, for moving fence, setting up fence on pasture, it can tend to be pretty simple because there's no obstructions. When you're Mongolian hooking your way through right. there, how long do you think you have to spend to, uh, you know, brush hog through there? Oh, uh, it, it varies a lot. The first time we chopped it down, we were, it was, you know, a, it felt like it was a stem every three inches that was 10 feet tall. Okay. It was, so it you're was using the same corridors all the <clears throat> time? Um, typically, yeah, I'll yeah. find a previous corridor and okay. chop it again. Um, okay. Some we've, we've brought the pigs through, so you know the, the brush is going to grow in the warm weather. So if I brought these pigs through in the spring, early spring, I wouldn't have to cut anything down again because there's yeah. no growth. Okay. But um, these these guys, there was a group that came through here. I want to say in April, just before we planted the squash, we had another group that came into the squash patch. Um, but from April to October. I could barely see the lines again because there was, you know, blackberries that had grown head high again, and we, we really had to chop some stuff back. I like the idea reuse it, do the major work once to clean sure. it out, and then reuse. Yeah, it gets easier every time. You know, the fact that they're grazing through this squash patch right now. One thing I want to touch on briefly here, just because the pigs are here, is you, know, you used to do a lot of veg farming, mm -hmm. and now you're mostly livestock. You have a small amount of veg that you grow. Why summer squash and why still grow veg when you're at this scale yeah. with livestock? Well, it's winter squash, but winter um, squash, sorry. We, uh, we, we, we grew in a kind of suburban, urban context before, um, you know, sub two acres for part of our time, a little bit over um, that in terms of cultivated ground afterwards. But we, were really, we never had a walk-in cooler. Um, we were close to the markets. We worked in the restaurants we sold to. Oftentimes we would literally pick in the morning and bring a box of veg to us with work that evening at our, our restaurant jobs. It was, the marketing of vegetables um, was in some ways easier and more possible because of our proximity. But now we, we haven't grown anything for over a year besides garlic and winter squash. And we like that because we, we know the varieties that our customers want and how to grow them and the work is minimal and, and the work is at the times of year when we have more time to do it, um, especially on the garlic front on, on that. Um, but we also just find that the storage crop factor is huge. We live way out here in the country. We've got um, big garage, root cellar. Mm -hmm. We can put away a few thousand pounds of squash. If we're really busy in October, we can sell it in December. Um, it works for us and we can get a little bit more of that income, kind of keep our foot in the door with our, our restaurant clients that we used to be visiting every week back when we were selling salad greens and now it's more like 
remember me it's october yeah. and it's at least we can do that and then and then maybe we'll sell them a pig that winter too who knows some benefits there it's not meant to be a huge driver no and it's not a huge input in terms of time either yeah it's it's a uh, we, we've we've gotten better and better at kind of you know this um with this piece of ground you know it's not we're not monocropping it's we're getting pigs we're getting a cover crop we're getting um garlic and we're getting winter squash off of it but we're trying to utilize the land well but <clears throat> but then yeah still something that we can do with it where yeah the time element really works we we have a tractor one row cultivator really basic minimal um minimal um infrastructure and, and needs on that front in terms of equipment um but we can we can grow the patch and mm. take care of it pretty easily and i, I like growing vegetables i kind of right, miss it so right. it's, it's good to be able to dip my toe back in there bit of a fun of hobby type yeah. thing yeah yeah right on yeah and it's fun to see that abundance too you know just like take care of this piece of ground the pigs will manure it for me and fluff it up and i can just come in with my tractor and sort of see you know we have all the all the carbohydrates we need as long as we can we like pumpkin soup and aren't tired of it like we we've got that for our family too it's great to be able to provide that for ourselves you know the pigs get the leftovers at the end of the day and right. it's just another thing to feel good about mm -hmm. having them eat so yeah yeah there you have it luke rose and his system for managing pigs on pasture and in the woods here at gross family farms it's one of the many livestock enterprises that he has going on pasture poultry turkey pigs sheep there's a lot happening here i love the way that luke's integrating pigs on the pasture to do the cleanup work in the garden and get them some different forage than they normally would find in the woods and the way that he's integrating them into the woods one challenge i see if you're gonna do pigs in the woods is getting up fence fencing and you know fencing them in in the woods which can be a lot of work to kind of wrap around trees but he's figured out a good way to make that work overall i like the system pretty simple pretty easy two two wires of fence sometimes just a single strand of hot wire to keep them in it's working for him they're profitable and it's one of those enterprises that is under the greater umbrella to make this farm function and support a family that's all for this one. If you want to learn more about Luke, check out his Instagram link below. And you can check out the podcast that Luke and I did. There's a link to that below as well. Thanks for watching this one. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.